All right, so the first thing we're going to start with is, is our review here. I wouldn't say it's, it's a review, but stuff that you still need to know. It is talking about some reactions. How do you do a particular reaction? Uh, for a lot of people, this is the ultimate goal of organic chemistry. We want to make this molecule. How do we do it? You probably touched on that a little bit last semester. Uh, this semester we'll go very much in depth and you'll be coming up with these sequences of 10 and 15 steps of how to get one thing into something else. So let's get started with that right now just to kind of set the tone. Everybody see that? Or should I turn the lights down in front here? Is it okay? Okay. All right, here's a little reaction. And I want to know what sort of reagents would you use to actually do that reaction? You want to give it a shot? Yeah, this is a bromination. Uh, what about co-reactants? Is that the only reagent, or do we need other things in there as well? That's pretty much it in this case. Right? Of course, you need a solvent. Um, that will depend on various factors, but uh, the important part is that bromine. Okay, so far so good. <clears throat> now we're going to keep the same starting material. Which, by the way, let's, let's do this. Uh, what would be the name of that starting material? Isopropene. Isopropene. Uh, or, I'm sorry. Not quite. I'm sorry. Uh, Terpene. Closer. Two methylpropene, yes. So that would be the, the best name for it. And let me let's talk about those other names. So this is give myself a little room here. Two methyl propene. Do you have to call it two methyl one propene? No. No, why not? Right, there's only one possible propene. Okay, why can't this be named uh, isopropene? Yeah, well, isopropyl, first of all, there are four carbons here. So calling something just a propene, even an isopropene, doesn't uh, account for that fourth carbon. Similarly, isopropyl is, is a group that attaches to something else. Isopropane is not a molecule by itself because there's no way to take three carbons and rearrange them in any other way than just straight across. Okay. Um, now, what about tert butene? Would that be another way to name this? Or was that a problem as well? What's the problem with that? Well, it has more uh, carbons. It's a substituent. Right. So, so that's right. So, tert butyl is a substituent. Uh, that attaches to something else from the tertiary carbon, which is the middle carbon. There, there isn't an individual molecule called terbutane. Now, there is another name for this one. Does anybody know what it is? This can also be called isobutane. Or, oh, I'm sorry, isobutene. Because isobutane is four carbons that are rearranged. So let's <coughs> remind ourselves of that. This molecule is isobutane. And actually, since this is sort of a more common name, this would probably be known as isobutylene. But we don't really call things that way anymore. OK, so nice, nice diversion into some naming. Again, just got to get the brain going a little bit, try to remember some of this stuff. OK, now we don't want to make this molecule. Now we want to make a 
this one. What do we use for that? Yeah, this would be a good spot for some HBR. Who made you pick that one? Uh, all right, so then the other part of that question then is, let's change this one more time. Yeah, this is going to be the addition of, again, we're still adding HBR, but this is in presence of peroxide. This is going to be a radical mechanism of addition and whatever peroxide you like is fine. We usually just say you can use some ROOR. Uh, this goes via a radical mechanism. So you have two different additions of VR and then the addition of dibromide. Okay. Everybody good so far? All right, let's move on. That's right. That's right. There's two different selectivities, uh, Markovnikov and anti-Markovnikov. Um, this one would be anti, and this one would be the Markovnikov addition. Um, I don't really care that you know those names, but you do need to know the results of those things, that is, which reagents to use and why. All right. Now, I'm not going to ask you to draw this right now, but think to yourself in your head, could you draw the mechanisms for those transformations? Could you draw the individual steps with the curved arrows for those different transformations? Maybe, maybe not the radical one, maybe that one's, not, that one's less important, but certainly the other two uh, you should be able to do. We're not going to do that right now, but if that's something that you don't feel comfortable with, make a little note to yourself to go review that at some point. Okay, let's get a little bit trickier. What makes this one trickier than the last ones? Are we? Oh yeah, actually, wait. I'm, I didn't mean to do that. Hang on. You're right. I didn't mean to add a methyl group. Let's try that. Now, who else was? Is that you? Where is it? Yeah, in this case, we're, it looks like it's sort of rearranging. The bromine is jumping from one to the other. Um, is there an individual reaction we know that will do that just on its own? Yeah, it's going to be a two-step process. So now it's not enough to just remember the one reaction that does this. We actually have to come up with a plan to do this transformation. So think about this for a minute. And, and Rather than ask you for the answer, I want to ask you what sort of, what you're thinking of, what kind of thing you're thinking about. You know that? Okay, why? Um, because, it, because that will form a double bond. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're right. Um, that is the way to do this, a two-step process. But let's think about let's think about kind of analyzing how you just explained it, which is correct. Um, but, but really, what you're saying, at least what I heard, was we know that we can make this from a double bond. We know that we can add HBr. We just did it. Right? That's a that's a reaction that we know. So if we can get a double bond from this first part, 
then we have a complete cycle. Then we know what those two steps are going to be. That's not exactly what you said. Um, but I'm sort of trying to, to lead, you in a lead you all in a certain direction. And that is that these things tend to work a little bit better when we actually work backwards rather than forwards. And a lot of you do this already in your head. You just don't really think about it. But what we're really saying is, I know that I can make this from this. And while we're at it, from, from some other stuff. Let's put some other choices on there. I know that I can make that also from this. That's also an addition of HBR. So then you continue to work backwards. Which one of those two choices gets me closer to, can I get to from here? Well, probably this one, right? Because I can get there via an elimination reaction. What reagents would you like to use for that elimination? So maybe some sodium methoxide for the, for the elimination. And then uh, we would bromination here. What, what made you pick that base, that sodium methoxide? Um, it is good at eliminating. OK. OK. Great. All right, let's change it a little bit then. So now I'm going to take the same product. Um, no, I'm sorry. I'm going to take the same reactant. I'm going to draw it again so we don't confuse ourselves here. But now instead of this product, I'll give you a related product. How does this question differ from the last one? That's right. We need a different type of elimination if we want to use the same process. In other words, this time we're going to go through this intermediate up here, or uh, I mean, uh, not that intermediate directly, but a related intermediate. We need to go through this intermediate now, doing the anti-Markovikov or radical HBR addition to get things in the right place. Okay. So this is still an elimination. How does it differ? Or what do you have to do to make it something different? Right. You want to put the double bond here. So you're going to use a much larger, much more hindered base that is not sterically able to get into the hydrogen uh, in that other position, in, in the tertiary position. So what type of reaction are we talking about here? What type of elimination are we talking about in both these cases? You got two choices. Everybody just shout it out. He, I'll give you a hint. One of them is, has a 1 in it, and one of them has a 2 in it. <laughs> so what type of mechanism are we trying to get here? E2. E2. Why? Well, think of it more from a strategic standpoint. We're, we want to pick the conditions now. We don't want to. Which is a two-step reaction? Careful there. E1 is a two-step reaction. 
because it goes through a carbocation intermediate. So this one doesn't. So, so this one doesn't. So we're, the point is that we're picking the conditions here. Right? We get to pick what reagent to use. We want to do an E2 reaction and not an E1 reaction. And why is that? Because you want a double bond in a certain uh, position. Right, exactly. The E1 reaction, we don't get as much control over because of the carbocation intermediate, because the rate determining step is the leaving group leaving. So we need to have conditions that we have control over so it only happens in one step and we only get the double bond that we want. Right. And that's really the, pop, the importance of all of that SN1, SN2, E1, E2 stuff that you went through for however many weeks in the first semester, is that you need to take the results from all that stuff and say, all right, what conditions do I need right here to get the thing that I want? And to do that, we want a nice big base that's a strong enough base to make sure that, we, that the E2 mechanism is uh, kinetically favored over the E1 mechanism. So what's your favorite E2 base? OK. Yeah, potassium terpetoxide. And you can draw that in various ways. Let's just remind ourselves of the actual whole structure of it. And that's what it would look like. Anybody else? Anybody have other big, fancy bases that they like? There are actually much better bases now that, that people tend to use than potassium terpetoxide. Uh, the, these, these very large, bulky nitrogen bases they're usually known by their initials, things like DBU, DBN, DABCO. Have you heard of those? Anybody heard of those things before? Yeah. Those tend to work a even better. Um, they're known as proton sponges for how well they deprotonate things. In, in many cases, and I don't think this book really talks about it, but in our previous book did, in, in many cases, there's actually not a huge uh, difference in what you get between these two bases, between methoxide and terpetoxide. So you'd actually still have a big mixture of products in the end that you'd have to separate out. But for you know, the general purposes of what we're doing, I think that's fine. We'll stick with that. All right. How are we doing? Okay. okay. If you're completely lost and freaking out, that's OK. But it means you have a little bit of work to do. Got to get into those problems. Got to go back and, and look at some of this stuff. Let's try another one. We did some practice now with halogens and with some stuff that halogens can do. Now let's look at some alcohol chemistry. We're going to get into more alcohol chemistry in chapter 13, but to do so, we need to review the stuff that we already know. So looking at this first, let's think about this uh, strategically. Is this the sort of thing that you think, just guess off of your head just by looking at it, is this going to be a one-step or a multi-step process? It's probably going to be a multi-step process. All right. So how would you do it? you got to get that OH to leave. Why? OK, so we're going to think about a similar strategy to before. Look at the end, look at what you have, and say, what do I get alcohols from? Where do alcohols come from? And where do they come from? Let's, let's think about the different ways that you make alcohols. Yeah, a generally addition of water to a double bond. So that could be oxymercuration. That could be um, acid catalyzed addition. Are there any other ways that we make alcohols? That's right, from the reduction of an aldehyde or ketone, although we won't get to that for a couple more chapters. So officially that's not allowed yet. But if actually, that's kind of a rule for this class, is if you actually know reactions that we haven't gotten to yet, you can still use them in this type of problem. Because you know that as long as they work, you, you're welcome to use them. Um, but you can also make alcohols from certain types of substitution. You can use water as a nucleophile sometimes, make, make things that way. Um, 
So this is, this is one of the ways you want to start thinking about these, is when you see a, a molecule, think to yourself, well, how do I make that sort of thing? How do I make that kind of functional thing? What is the list of reactions that I know that will lead to that? And that'll help you to kind of build this toolbox, they call it, as we start adding to the toolbox uh, in this year, getting more and more ways to make things. And in fact, by uh, mid-semester or later, all of these problems will have many multiple answers, correct answers, because you'll know so many different reactions and so many different ways to do things. That's supposed to make it sound easier, but maybe it doesn't. I don't know. Let me add a page here. OK, so back to this problem then. We're going to do the same kind of thing, where we see this alcohol is coming from an alkene um, through the addition of water. Now, what type of addition of water would you like to do? I heard the oxymercuration would be one way to do it. Or acid catalyze. Or acid catalyze. Is one better than the other in this case? I mean, depends on what you have laying around. Depends on what you have laying around, yeah, always. One subject or that's right. So which of those two techniques, oxymercuration or acid catalyzed addition, is susceptible to carbocation rearrangement? Acid catalyzed. The acid catalyzed. You protonate the alkene, and then you leave a carbocation, and that can potentially rearrange. Is that a problem for us in this case? Not really, because we know that more substitute. That's right. In this case, carbocation rearrangement isn't an issue because we ultimately want to substitute on the most substituted carbon. We want to get to that tertiary carbocation, which is going to anyway. So if there's not an issue there, then you might as well use the slightly easier conditions. Um, now, these things are always subject to experimental design and what actually works or doesn't work. So sometimes you try it in the lab, even though it looks like it's going to work on paper, it doesn't work. So you've got to think about a different technique. But this, this should work here just fine. And then, again, we have to make this double bond. So how are you going to make this double bond? Now, here's a good example where there's a couple good um, ways to do it. But I think one of them we don't talk about until the next chapter. So it's officially not allowed yet. If anybody had it from a different class, you might know. Yeah, so let's, let's go through uh, uh, both of these methods, or at least address them. The one that you do know, because we talked about it last semester, is to make the alcohol into a leaving group and then eliminate it. So that's going to be a two-step reaction with something like a tosylate or a mesylate or a triflate or one of these groups that makes alcohols into better leaving groups. Um, with a base, usually you have to have a base around this book prefers pyridine, which is commonly used as a base in this situation. And then you need to actually eliminate it with whatever relatively small elimination base you like. Now, you can actually dehydrate alcohols directly. You can heat them up in acid, and they will turn into hydronium, basically, and fall off, and then forming a carbocation. Um, and eliminate. In this case, that would work because you get the most substituted double bond. We'll talk about that a bit in the next chapter. So here's another plan, a nice synthesis plan. This is technically a three-step synthesis because the first transformation is, is really three steps, or is really two steps. OK. Um, I'm going to stop talking for a second and give you a couple more to think about on your own. And then we'll come back and talk about them. And that'll get us close to the end of class. There's one. <coughs> and 
And then here's another one. We're going to start with the same starting material. So give those a try. Take about five minutes or so. Let's first look at this first one. Now this one, both of these are a step beyond what we were just talking about, meaning they're a little bit of a stretch. They're a little bit tougher. The reason for that is there are more steps. And the, the reason that more steps is tougher is, I'm, I mean, kind of obvious. But also, it's that the di what you need to do, the path you need to take between the beginning and the end is more and more obscure because there are more and more choices of what sorts of reactions you can do when. And this is where working backwards becomes much, much more important. If you work forwards and you say, what do I react a double bond with? And then what do I react that with? You can kind of get yourself in various different paths that never end up leading to the product because all of those things will react with, will you know, possibly do many reactions. But if you start from the end and you say, what can I make this from? There are much fewer paths that you can take and much fewer places that you can get confused and lost. So let's do that. Let's just look at this first one for now. In fact, I'm just going to grab it and copy it over here. So we won't even think about that second one for now. What do we make this from? Or what do you want to make that from? A terminal alkene. And in this case, that's pretty much the only choice. There are a couple other possible ways to do this. But you know, but, but that's really the way to do it. Now, I heard a lot of people saying, um, well, you know, I kind of remember this stuff, and as soon as you say the reaction, I totally got it. And that's good. That's a good starting place. Of course, that won't get you all the points in the exam. But this is actually the most important part. If you can get that that's coming from this, even if you can't actually remember exactly what to put on the arrow, that to me is worth some, some points because that shows that you're thinking the right way about it. So what are the, the conditions here? Anybody remember? Yeah, just for that one step. That's right. So this is going to be the radical or anti-Markovnikov addition of HBr. OK. So now this becomes a different problem. And, again, and every time you take a step back, it gets a little bit easier, a little bit easier until it's just one step. Now, we don't care about the product anymore. We care about this transformation. How do we get from this double bond to this double bond? Well, first of all, what do you get a double bond from? Elimination, elimination generally, right? So this is going to end up some kind of elimination somewhere All right. Um, to get this. So let's pick one. Again, the exact conditions at this point are less important than the overall plan. So we're just, for the sake of planning, say that we have a leaving group right there. Some kind of leaving group. Could be a tosylate or a bromine or whatever. It'll depend a little bit on what we pick. But we definitely want a leaving group there. And then we want to use some kind of large base to do that transformation, to make the Hoffman elimination or the Hoffman product, the less substituted uh, alkene. And now the question becomes, how do we take this alkene and end up with a leaving group right there? And there are a few answers to that question. So what would you like to do? You can do the radical bromination again. 
That would be one way to do it. So that would be Okay, so there's your leaving group right there, the bromine. What would be another way to do this? What other types of leaving groups are there? Um, iodine, but can you add iodine in this way through a radical addition? You can't. Um, you said you guess not because the tone of my voice made it obvious or because you actually, okay. <laughs> okay, um, yeah. No, that's, there are many, you know, chlorine, iodine, also, also good leaving groups, but the bromine radical, if you remember, has a special stability that allows it to do some things that the other uh, halogen radicals can't. Remember, radical chlorination is kind of just a scattershot process where the chlorine kind of goes everywhere, so you can't really rely on it that way. Um, what, about, what about alcohols? What if we wanted this leaving group to be a tosylate? That's certainly a good leaving group that we can do this sort of thing with. So that means that it's coming from an alcohol. Sorry, I know you can't do this on your notes. I try, I'll try to avoid that. How would we put an alcohol there? and oxidation is going to be the way to go. The other way, acid-catalyzed addition of water would lead the, uh, to the other selectivity, so we'd end up with the alcohol on the other side, which wouldn't work in this case. Or, I mean, it would work, but it would give us the wrong reaction, ultimately. It wouldn't be a good part of the synthesis. All right, that's about it. Uh, any last questions before we go upstairs? What about the alcohol? Oh, we can get to that. Um, we'll do that next time. Go home, look it up as you're studying, as you're looking. I hope that I've scared you enough not scared you, encouraged you to go look at your book and try to remember some of this stuff uh, for Wednesday. So let's go upstairs and actually take 10 minutes. So if you need to grab something to drink or whatever, and I'll meet you upstairs at 5 to 2.